So a future without server, that's an interesting concept. And I start to think, well, what's the relationship between developers and servers, between developers and infrastructure? It's actually something that goes quite back in time. So a few weeks ago, I was working in the British Library here in London, not far from here, and I stumbled into this letter. This is a letter from Ada Lovelace to Charles Babbage, uh, from 1843. And in this letter, she described probably the first idea of a computer program. There could be something that we can design, that an engine can build, can compute, without being done by a hand or a, or a brain. And Ada Lovelace, was an, she had an incredible life. She, she was the daughter of Lord Byron, a poet and a dandy. And her mother, uh, scared to have another poet in the family, focused her on scientific studies, and she became a great mathematician. And with the help of Charles Babbage, she helped build the first mechanical general purpose computer. This is the, uh, the, the, the computer engine, uh, the, uh, and the analytical engine, and this is reproduction is in the Science Museum here in London. And uh, among other things, she was also translating other articles into English, and when she was translating an article on the analytical machine by an Italian mathematician, uh, uh, Luigi Menabrea, that happened to be also one of the first prime ministers of United Italy, uh, she added some notes to this translation. And this that you can see here is probably the first written computer program. And it's uh, actually very similar to what we will do now. This is to compute Bernoulli numbers, so something quite mathematically advanced. But we can see that there are steps, there are variables, working variables, results from each step that are passed to the next step. So something that we do today started probably at that time. And the first developer was probably the one that helped design the first computer. But computers and infrastructure is evolving over time. Now there's a lot of discussion around quantum computing, for example. So when we're moving the, the, the fundamental uh, building block from bits to qubits. So a qubit is a, uh, a unit of quantum information and has all these strange properties from quantum computing. So with bits, we know there's a zero or a one, and then we can build everything we want. With quantum uh, bits, with qubits, we have these strange properties that when you measure them, they're always zero or one. But when you don't look at them, they can be a superposition of the two states. And also, qubits can be entangled with each other. So when you me measure one qubit and you find that zero or one, this is affecting the result of other qubits. So something completely new that is coming probably shortly uh, as a tool for developers to use. So if infrastructure is always evolving from mechanical tools to quantum computing, what's the role of the developers? And the best description that I found is, is this one from the BBC Bite Size uh, website. This is an, an online training for uh, young children. And it tells basically what we do as developers. You use code to tell a computer what to do, but before writing your code, you need an algorithm. And then the algorithm is a list of rules that tells how you, what you need to do to solve a problem. So looking at this, uh, our job looks like uh, translation. We need to translate algorithms from a generic language to a computer programming language. Actually, it's, it's more than that, and we know, otherwise we were not here discussing about tools and, and, uh, and best practices. There's a lot of complexity, and uh, lots of people understood that already from the 70s. This is a, a completely empirical law, it's called Gold's Law, it comes from his book from the 70s, and it's, it tells us that a complex system can't uh, it's always been evolved starting from a simple system. You can't design a complex system and build it and it will work. You need to start with something simple and add features one by one. And what was an empirical law in the 70s, it has become a, a, a scientific law in, the, in, in our days, because in the last 15, 20 day, years, uh, a new science has been born. It's the complexity science. It's a science that is studying uh, complexity across all different fields, biology, mathematics, physics. And the same rules apply all, also to uh, to, to, to IT system, to computer science. So what we discovered is something that probably we already know, that complexity arises when the dependencies among the elements become important. And when we create something, uh, we do an IT project, we create a new application, we usually have two kinds of dependencies. The technical dependencies, I need to update these to have that working, for example, 
and also organizational dependencies. Uh, if uh, I want to release my software, I need to wait for someone else to give me the OK on the security or to give me an IP address for my new services and so on. So reducing dependencies is really the best way to reduce complexity. And if something is less complex, it's probably evolving faster. And what we heard from our customers is really this, that they want to focus on code, on the applications, on the functions that they want to build on this application. So uh, a few years ago, we started thinking about this. And what we do in, uh, in Amazon when we want to create something new is that we work backwards from the customer. So I think this is a, a good way also for you. So if you have an idea, you want to build something new, a service, a product, the first step is to write the press release of this service when you are going to launch it in the future. Because writing the, the hypothetical press release of your new product will force you to think in simple terms to describe the advantages that you want to build, uh, and also to think through the eyes of who is going to read this press release of your possible future customers. And then when you write the press release, so you realize actually that there's something that you can build, then start thinking about the questions that you can get, start writing even the manual before even you start writing your first line of code of your application. And doing that, we, uh, we start to look at what our customers are doing to work backwards from them. So we saw that roughly 10, 12 years ago, they start splitting the monolith because they wanted to remove this complexity. They wanted to remove the dependencies. But at the time, uh, CPU power, network speed, they were not enough. We were probably also using the wrong protocols, uh, SOAP, uh, XML. They were quite heavy, uh, especially for the resources that we had. Uh, things changed probably around five, six years ago. So the speed of CPUs, the speed of networking, the availability of new protocols that are much more efficient, such as a JSON or uh, binary encodings of JSON, made possible to break this large application and create smaller components, uh, reducing the dependencies. So reducing dependencies is a broad topic. There's three days, box days on that. I just learned on, on microservices. So I'm not diving into that. But if you start to decompose your application, uh, then what you start to see is that the way data is flowing uh, through your application becomes an important part of your software architecture because uh, the way data is flowing is really driving uh, the, the logic between the small components, the microservices that you're, that you're building. And what we saw is also that some of those components could be replaced by standard bricks. So you don't need to create a relational database from scratch every time you need it. So you can use start and building blocks, a message queuing, a database table, um, uh, an object storage. And then you need just to write the glue code between those components. And this glue code is your business logic. It's what's unique to your application. And Looking at this, we realize that we can even decompose this more and create smaller components that are functions, ephemeral functions. And these ephemeral functions can just react to the, data, to the flow of the data, to the data flow. So when you receive an API call, we can create this function that can process, route this information, and send it uh, to the relevant service uh, or, uh, or a subsystem or, uh, or building brick. And when you don't need to, to run these ephemeral functions, uh, there's nothing to, 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 to be kept ongoing. So as a cloud provider, it's incredibly efficient to run these functions for you. And that's why we, uh, we think we were able to reduce and create this very low cost uh, platform. But what happens to the data? Because it's relatively easy to decompose compute. What happens to the data? Well, uh, this is a, a very useful diagram that shows you how two microservices are sharing their own uh, relational database. Uh, this is really uh, uh, giving you the, the, the weight of data. Uh, if you start uh, creating dependencies through the database between two microservices, you're probably creating a distributed monolith. So uh, data should drive the boundaries. What we see is that you should uh, distribute your data with smaller uh, data repositories that are not shared between microservices but should speak through their main interface. And we should move these uh, data repositories from the old uh, at atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable model to a new approach that is associative, commutative, distributed, in a single word, idempotent. Because in a distributed world, you should always think uh, with, uh, that anything can, happens, uh, can happen at least once. 
uh, it's always better to think in an at least once uh, perspective than in an exactly one uh, approach. And actually, this is also something old. Uh, I found this a paper from Jean Grey he, he, from 1981. He, he, he is from uh, Tandem Computers. I don't know if anybody here remembers Tandem Computers. They were building these large fault tolerance systems. And here he was analyzing the idea of uh, the, conce the concept of transaction. It was quite new at the time. And he said that update in place uh, that is something that breaks the idempotency of a, of, of a database, is really a cardinal sin because it's going against everything we've done for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years of accountancy, uh, you, you never find an accountant that deletes something and writes over. You always add below. I think it's also required by the law. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and maybe we should start to think in this way when we build our data repositories. And so what happens to the data flow? As I said before, when you start to build smaller components, the flow of the data becomes important. Uh, so the data uh, becomes the source of the, of the events. Because if you have a small database where you have all your customer, a small database where you have all your orders, another database where you have all your uh, travel ticketing systems, uh, when you add a record, you're actually telling something about your business. You're telling that uh, a new customer has been created, a new trouble ticket has been opened, a new order has been uh, created by a customer. So these events that are normally seen as technical events are actually business events. And they create a sort of uh, ordered history of, of your business, and they have this beautiful property of being immutable, because when something happens, you don't need to update it. You know that it's, uh, it happened at this moment in time. And immutable information is great for distributed systems, because it's much easier to manage than something that has a state. So this event can be the trigger of your business logic. So you can start to think in your business logic uh, differently. So if a new customer has been created, what's the effect of this? Because our brains think in this way. And this is the idea of event-driven architecture, linking the business logic of your application to the business events that happen. This is something we did always for years for user interfaces. Now, in user interfaces, uh, using patterns such as the observer pat uh, pattern, we monitor the components of the user interface, and if something happens in one of the targets, then we can trigger an action, like check the syntax, uh, create the user, uh, what I'm proposing here is really to, to move that into the infrastructure level. So the platform itself is the observer. It can monitor multiple targets, such as a, an object storage, a database table that contains your customers or your users, a stream of events. And if something happens there, you can trigger an action. And this action is your business logic. I have a new user. I need to start the validation of the user. I need to go through fraud management to check if the user is valid or not, and so on. And really to think in this new way that is completely different from what we were doing in the past, I think that you should not think of triggers like service A triggers service B, but you should think of cause and effects. Because our brains have evolved uh, for millions of years thinking of looking for a cause for any effect. Sometimes we look for a cause even if there isn't, but in this case it's useful. So don't say uh, service A is triggered for service B or vice versa, I think what is the cause. So in this case, service B is caused by service A. For example, if I create a new user, this is creating a validation process. And if you need to add a new feature to this application, again, you can think of cause and effect. What, what is the cause for the new service that I need to add? And then you will naturally find the way to link this to your event-driven architecture. And this can also be cyclic. This can implement acknowledgement and also replace distributed transactions. So for example, you can have a business process, a new user has been created, you started the validation, the fraud check, uh, the credit card check, whatever, and then at the end of this chain, you send back uh, an event that gives uh, an OK to this new customer that has been created. And in this architecture, it's service as a local visibility. So it's function, for example, only needs to know what's the input, what they need to do inside, and who they need to notify with their output events. So even if you have hundreds or thousands of services or functions acting together, uh, as a developer, you just need to know locally what's your input, your business logic, and who you need to signal that to. 
And to make this even easier, I created this open source tool. So it's available on GitHub. It works completely in the, in, in the browser. So if you want, you can just download it and run it. It's uh, serverless by design. It's a tool that can help you try to design graphically an event-driven architecture and start thinking in this new way. And if you want, it can also help you build it uh, uh, actually uh, in a real implementation. So what does the future look like? Well, uh, I don't know if we will use quantum computers or uh, we will use something different in five or ten years. What I've seen, and it's gone through the, all the history of development, is that we will focus more and more only on the business logic. So all the code we will write in the future will only be your own unique business logic. Thank you.